I want all of you to reflect what you have learned in the previous uh, lecture and try to summarize. So the way we we're going to do this by um, in pairs, you know, you discuss with your friend sitting next to you, and I'll give you about three minutes or four minutes and try to summarize what you have learned in the previous lecture, important points that you have learned. And after that, I will invite one or two of you to come uh, in front here to explain to the class. Okay? So this is a good way to summarize the gist of what we have learned. In very briefly, okay? so discuss with your friend next to you. Ex try to explain, try to explain what you have understood to your friend, and after that switch. Okay. Three minutes, three minutes, not more than three minutes. I would like to invite maybe two person here. Maybe one is Shuhaira. Shuhaira, right? Shuhaira. Ah, uh, more, 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 look, more or less the same. <laughs> Shuaira and maybe who else? Eh? Mongling. Ah, <laughs> uh, Mongling. Okay. Shuaira first. Can you come forward? Very briefly, just the, the gist, in the party, the essence. From our previous lesson, okay, um, stash, okay. Stash uh, in the native form. Uh, we can find it uh, in tuber uh, uh, such as uh, cassava. If cassava is a root, okay, uh, tuber, uh, and then uh, from rice um, and also corn. Okay, um, uh, the starch contain uh, uh, amylose and amylopectin. Okay, amylose contain alpha one four glycosidic bond. Uh, and uh, amylopectin contain uh, one four glycosidic bond, uh, which branch uh, one six glycosidic bond. Okay. Um, uh, the important point here is that uh, amylose uh, can form strong gel, uh, whereas uh, amylopectin uh, uh, form uh, does not does not form uh, jelly properties. Correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> okay, and then uh, the uh, see of the uh, uh, molecular weight, uh, amylose uh, has a lower molecular weight compared to amylopectin. Uh, okay, um, under the uh, polarized light, uh, the gelatinization of starch showing the uh, preferences. Mm. Not not the gelatinization. When we look the when look when we look the starch native starch granule under the microscope, um, under 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 the polarized Polarize microscope, that. so you can see the multis cross. It is due to the 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 bifringence effect. What in the starch granule give that effect? The multis cross. What what component in the starch granule give that effect? Uh, amylopectin because? Because the amylopectin form the crystalline, crystalline uh, structure. structure. So therefore, starch is a semi-crystalline. So you can see that under the mi polarized microscope. What happens if we uh, cook the starch? Would we still see the Multis cross? No. Because so we can use that as, a, as an indication of uh, whether the starch is fully cooked. Fully cooked or not, right? And we can, motor, we can monitor the process of gelatinization by looking at the changes in the uh, uh, multis cross. If, it is, if uh, the multis cross disappears completely, meaning that the starch has been fully, fully cooked. cooked or fully gelatinized. Okay, that's some of the gist. Okay, what about Mongling? 
Maybe you want to give other points than uh, what Shuhaira has given. Uh, you can stand there if you like, uh, but speak loud. Actually, my point is almost the same with her. Okay. And just some add on, I need to add. Okay. Is it um, the structure, the growth ring okay. that we observe? Uh -huh. Actually, it is constructed by the semi crystalline uh, in the mm. layer and mm. the amorphous followed by that. Okay. Then it will in parallel way mm -hmm. then so the growth ring represents what <coughs> represent the alternate layer right uh -huh. uh, the alternate layer of the crystalline lamella uh -huh. the crystalline lamella which this crystalline lamella consists of the uh, the short chain amylopectin branches so it alternate with the crystalline lamella and the amorphous lamella the amorphous lamella consists of the the, the the alpha 1 6 branching point the branch point before we get the the clusters the amylopectin branch clusters you get just imagine a ranting kayu yeah? you get the ranting but before the ranting branch out you get the point where it start to branch out that is the amorphous lamella then you have the bulk amorphous the bulk amorphous consists of the amylose, right? Mm. Uh, so that is important to understand the structure, how the amylose and the amylopectin being organized or packed together in, in the granule, right? Okay, more? Mm, what, else? what about the, what happened when we uh, use X-ray uh, to characterize the, the different type of starch? They will look in a different shape and they will they will show different X-ray pattern, ah. pattern, right? Different X-ray pattern. So how do we group the pattern? Group the pattern. How many different patterns are there? A, B, uh, a, B and C. B and yeah. So serial starches fall under which group? Like corn, rice, and you know others fall under A. <laughs> and tuber B. And what what about C? Ah, Yishan has uh, disclosed uh, that sago show C pattern, but she got that information from one paper from Fasi Hudin, right? Uh, she's a uh, Oh, no, not you. Yeah. But I share one paper. It's my own paper. <laughs> so I don't know whether you have downloaded that paper. It's free. Uh, we can, you can get the whole. That's a very comprehensive review, actually, on Sago starch. So before, before I, I give you a lec one lecture on Sago, please read those, that, those papers. La Fasi Udin also a very good paper. And my paper, of course, because it's cover everything on Sago. Yeah, the composition. Yeah. The ratio between amylose and amylopectin is very uh, important because it affects the properties. But other than amylose and amylopectin, what other components in starch that can affect the functional properties? Lipid and, ah, lipid and protein. And how they affect the properties, we have to, we have to find out. And there are also other components, minor components such as phospholipid, phosphorus, yeah? uh, especially in, in potato starch. Potato starch is the granule can swell very big. The swelling power is, is high compared to other starch. One of the reasons because of the presence of phosphorus. Yeah? Um, so these are the, the minor components. Thank you. So I, I encourage you to use this technique, you know, try to explain to your friend what you have understood from the previous lecture. Uh, the technique that we, are, that we use is now is called think, think, Pair, so we do it in pair, and then share. Okay, so I want to try this more and more in my, in my class so that you can use this as a reflection. Yeah, remember the best way to learn is to teach. The best way to learn is to teach. When we are teaching someone, we get a better understanding. When I teach about touch. Of course, I did my PhD everything on starch, but the more I teach about, talk about starch, the more I understand about starch. So the best way to learn is to teach. And to teach is to learn twice. 
Because you, before you teach, you have to really understand, right? Otherwise, you, you, you cannot teach. So please take this uh, message and try to practice more. Now, we have covered briefly in few lectures what starch is, how we extract starch from different sources, tuber, roots, cereal, what are the components and composition of starch, the characteristic of main component, amylose and amylopectin, and we know there are also other minor components, although they are present in small amount, but they have significant effect on the properties, functional properties of starch. Okay? So now, we want to learn more about the functional properties of starch and how we can exploit these properties in food product. And one of the important properties is gelatinization. When we cook the starch, the starch will undergo a process of gelatinization. This is when we get the functionalities of starch. In starch industry or in the industry, whenever we use starch, they have this, this term, they call it to functionalize the starch. So if you work with people from national starch or from starch industry, they use this term, to functionalize the starch. It simply means that we want to get whatever properties that we want, the function of the starch. In, this, uh, in some cases, we, want this, we use the starch to get as a thickener. We want the viscosity. In other situations, maybe we want to get, use the starch as a so-called like a gelling agent yeah, to, to form a gel. In other situations, we want to use the starch for other properties. So in other words, we want to get the functions. So that's the meaning of to functionalize the starch, to get whatever properties that we want from starch. So now uh, the other one, apart from gelatinization, the, as a consequence of gelatinization, the next event is a retrogradation. So it's, they always sort of together. Gelatinization always followed by retrogradation. In most cases, um, we do not want retrograde, retrogradation because it can cause some uh, uh, undesirable effect. Like in bread, uh, when the starch in the bread undergo retrogradation, the, the, the texture of the bread will become firmer, harder, and drier. So, you know, maybe from your experience after we store the bread for but maybe nowadays it's difficult to see that because nowadays our bread is very, the technology is so advanced. But in the old days, in the old days, when there are not so many, there are not so many types of bread at that time. Yeah? Uh, so you will see after even two days, the bread will become harder, firmer, and brittle, more brittle, drier. So it's not, not that nice. Yeah? But nowadays, um, maybe even after one week, the bread is still good because we have added so many different types of additive to not to stop, but to minimize or to slow down the process of retrogradation. Yeah? But that's the effect, the undesirable effect of retrogradation. Uh, the gel, the starch gel, if we form a gel, will become harder, firmer, and sometimes we get uh, a phenomenon called synergesis. The water in the gel sort of, yeah, sort of uh, squeeze out from the gel structure. Sometimes you can see also not in starch or in agar gel, you can get also separation of the water, uh, which to the industry is not good. But uh, in the gel, sometimes the, the, the water actually in the form of syrup separate from the gel, then it's quite nice. You can drink. You can sip the water, then you, you eat the gel. But in starch product, usually this is a, something that is not really desirable. So those are the negative effects of retrogradation. In most cases, we don't, we don't want. But in some cases, we do want retrogradation. Yeah? For example, nowadays, uh, there is a product called resistant starch. Yeah? Resistant starch. 
in most cases we want starch to be digested easily especially in you know products for baby infant food we want the starch to be digested easily so that the baby you know don't have problem to digest the starch so in this case we use pre gelatinized starch and and so on so that the starch can be digested easily but in 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 resistant starch it's the opposite we do not want the starch to be digested and it's very popular uh, uh, ingredient now in you know even Nestle also if you notice they promote some of their products they said contain resistant starch I don't know whether you notice or not uh, yeah Nestle also now using some of uh, this resistant starch in some of their products what is the use of resistant starch huh? Ah, it become like a fiber, hard to digest. Then, yeah. Not only, not only because if you want to use resistant resistant starch as a fiber, you can also use other type of fibers. Why resistant starch? Have you read anywhere? Because now you are in final year, I, I assume that you have read a lot of articles, you know, uh, about food. So maybe you have come across about resistant starch, maybe. Have you, have you heard the ter uh, one term, uh, prebiotic? Ah. Oh, and probiotic. And do you know the difference? So resistant starch has been shown by doing uh, by uh, from research has been shown to have a prebiotic property prebiotic means you know probiotic is the the bacteria the good bacteria like acido uh, bacillus acidophilus the bifidobacteria lactobacillus in our yogurt in yakult in uh, vitagen the <coughs> put this they add this bacteria because they are good friendly bacteria so when we drink yakult this bacteria is supposed to colonize our colon and they will produce like butyric acid and so on which is good for our physiological uh, for our health good for our gastrointestinal system so you know when your stomach your intestine your 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 colon everything in good condition it will generally your health also will be good if your stomach got problem, then the whole system also will, will have problem. So this is good, friendly bacteria. But this bacteria also is very sensitive to, you know, they, uh, heat, they, uh, they can easily die. So. so in order to promote the growth, now this is a good bacteria that we want to help them to grow so that they can multiply. The more, we want more of them. You see, in Yakul, they claim they have how many billions billions not million of good bacteria but by the time you drink yakult how, how many how, how many how much uh, bacteria viable bacteria is still there maybe you know thousands only yeah so now the industry is trying to find ways to maintain the viability of this bacteria in the product as well as in the system because in the system they have to f fight with the enemies the bad bacteria we have so many bad bacteria also so the theory says the more good bacteria we have in the system the less the pathogenic bacteria and other bad bacteria uh, will grow in our system so they defeat the enemy and they will thrive sort of so this is when the prebiotic comes in you can think of prebiotic like food for the good bacteria. Uh, so we have like inulin, we have FOS, fructo oligosaccharide from inulin, we have a few things. And resistant starch has been found to promote the growth of this probiotic. Uh, so now that's why we want to produce more resistant, resistant starch because, of course, inulin. And FOS, fructo oligosaccharide, is a very good uh, prebiotic, but then they are expensive. 
they are expensive. Uh, maybe you have seen also Nestle add inulin in the milk. And uh, so have you ever tried to find out why they add inulin? Inulin, why they add force? Because the theory is when the baby or whoever drink the milk, the inulin will promote the growth, support the growth of the good bacteria. Okay, but that will that that actually cause the the product con containing inulin to have a higher price. So industry always look for cheaper option, cheaper alternative. In this case, resistant starch is a cheaper. To produce resistant starch, resistant starch means it is resistant to the action of the enzyme in our stomach. So it won't be digested in our stomach. Then, if it's not digested, where it will go? Next. It will go finally to the colon. In the colon, it will, be, it will get fermented by the good bacteria. And the process in the, of that fermentation, the good bacteria will be happy. They will grow happily. And the byproduct of that is product like butyric acid, the short chain fatty acid. Butyric acid is short chain fatty acid, which have also a good uh, effect on the food, good physiological effect on the body. Uh, but now the challenge is how to make starch resistant to the action of enzyme. We know that uh, uh, starch in a normal form would be easily digested by alpha amylase and amyloglucosidase, right? But now how, how we make it resistant? Ah. So this is now we can manipulate the process of ret retrogradation. And this time we want retrogradation. We want to retrograde the starch so that the, the because retrograded starch is more resistant to enzyme action compared to normal non-retrograded starch. So this time you want to find the condition where the starch would retrograde. During retrogradation, actually the starch would crystallize. Even the amylose now, during retrogradation, would crystallize. And amylopectin, to some extent, would crystallize. But during retrogradation, after cooking, yeah, after gelatinization, during retrogradation, the amylose component would retrograde much faster than the amylopectin. And they are very res resistant to enzyme action. So if I ask you, give one example when retrogradation, retrogradation is not desirable, and one example of when retrogradation is desirable. So I hope you can. But maybe you want to find more example when for these two situation, when the retrogression is desirable and undesirable. Okay. But we are jumping the gun now, talking more about retrogression. Let's talk about gelatinization. So we have native starch in water, and we call it starch suspension, or sometimes we use the term starch slurry. And we know that at room temperature, the starch is not soluble, insoluble. And um, it doesn't swell also, unless we live for a long time, it, it can absorb some water. But when we heat up, when we, so now uh, the granules is in a, in a powder form, it is uh, the glass, it, uh, at a, a glassy, in a glassy form, meaning that we have the glass transition temperature. Please recall the IMK 209. So, to in a in a in a powder form, it's in a glassy state. But when we add water, the water acts as a plasticizer. Yeah, then it will depress the TG. And now the, the temperature of the, that because we are heating up, so the temperature will increase. The T now become above Tg, so it will become rubbery. So now we 
the granule now would absorb more and more water and it will start to swell. So I hope all of you have watched the video. Yeah, uh, you can see the granule start to swell. That's the best uh, illustration of the swelling of the granule during heating. And it will continue to granule, uh, to, to, to swell. So in this form, it's partially hydrated, swollen granule. And now, we increase the temperature above the TM. TM is melting temperature. But we know that for amorphous material, there is no TM. We talk about TG only for amorphous, right? So why we talk about TM here? Melting. Which component in the starch granule actually melt? Does amorphous melt? No. What about crystalline? Yeah. When we say melting, we refer to a crystal. Only crystal melt. So which component in the starch granule melt? Amylopectin, because the amylopectin form the crystalline phase or crystalline domain in the granule. So the TM here refers to the gelatinization, uh, the melting of the amylopectin. So here the starch would start to gelatinize. So that, that is the onset, permulaan, that is the onset of gelatinization. So the term gelatinization actually refers to a collective event. Beberapa event yang berlaku. Absorption of water, swelling of the granule, yeah? then um, increase in viscosity. So here from this point right up to that, to this point, from this point up to this point, there is a progressive increase in the viscosity. So swelling, increase in viscosity, and also at the same time, although it's not, it's not uh, shown here, some of the short chain amylose linear chain would diffuse out from the granule. Uh, in the video, you cannot see that, of course, because we, we cannot see molecules. We can only see the granules. Yeah? So some of the short chain amylose would come out. Amylopectin would remain inside the granule at up to this point because they are big molecule and they have branches so they are, and they are entangled with each other so it's not easy for them to diffuse out but the linear amylose molecule especially the shorter chain can uh, sort of diffuse out from the granule so this is a melted hydrated swollen granules but during cooking in most cases we have also shear. We have stirring. We have maybe, or uh, yeah, mo most of the time we have, you know, uh, some form of shear. So because now the starch is subjected to shear, the swollen granule is very sensitive to shear. So it can now rupture, can cause rupture, and when it when the granule ruptured. We will release the whatever content in the granule. So we have now the amylopectin and amylose. Now in the uh, in the sol form, SOL, in the sol form, like a solution. Lah. But technically, when we say solution, it contain only uh, you know small molecular weight that solubilize completely. But it's actually more like a colloidal solution so we use the term salt but now we have now amylopectin freely you know moving around swimming around together with the amylose so that what that is the the, the whole event here is a process of gelatinization this is the onset and that is sort of called the completion part of gelatinization 
we have a long standard definition from this so it's a process involve the ruptured rupture ruptured and collapse of the the, the order of in a molecule susun ato the you know uh, initially the amylopectin and amylose is being you know organized in an ordered form structured in the granule but now uh, everything is disrupted and it is this cause changes irreversible changes when it's ruptured that's it you cannot put it together and form a granule so it's irreversible and this is what happens during the gelatinization the onset titik permulaan and the range of gelatinization temperature will depend on concentration of starch how we observe that whether we observe under the microscope we look at the multi cross or maybe we can use other methods like by maybe using DSC probably the, easy, the easiest way to see to look at the DSC or by using uh, instrument like uh, visco amylograph or rapid visco analyzer so we monitor the viscosity so there are many ways to determine so when the gelatinization start and what is the range of the temperature to complete the whole gelatinization process it depends on the, the, the method that we use to measure or to observe the process sometimes they are slightly different because when we look under the microscope maybe you know um, it's quite subjective but by using instrument uh, like DSC or rapid visco analyzer is probably more objective and easier to determine the onset and the final okay go go come in come in eh? can you answer that question or oh, the, the answer is there the notes no ah. you can starch undergo gelatinization without heating cannot <laughs> can ah. but slow motion <laughs> take time everything gelatinized if you wait long enough <laughs> yeah if you don't heat then how do we gelatinize the starch what is huh? use chemical uh, use chemical what type of chemical Shen? no idea yeah. by using enzyme no but you have to gelatinize the starch first if you add enzyme to the ungelatinized starch in a dry form well there's some research have shown that some uh, hydrolysis would, would occur also because there's still some moisture there but not gelatinization but we can use chemical yes azura said chemical but what kind of chemical we can use hmm? dmso yeah you're quite right but for food application can we use dmso by the by, by the way what is dmso dimethyl sulfoxide but for food application can we use dmso dmso uh, is not is not uh, it's only used for analytical purposes for for food analysis yes we can solubilize the starch by using the mso in fact you can also break down the starch if you to, if you we use too much of the mso usually we use the mso to solubilize starch for analysis for hplc and so on yeah so the mso is actually a powerful uh, solvent to solubilize starch and in fact technically it will gelatinize starch because it will allow, it will uh, it will make the starch granule to swell yeah and when the starch granule swell it's kind of solubilized but there's a common chemical we use to gelatinize starch even without heating NaOH sodium 
hydroxide, yeah, NaOH, or any alkaline solution. KOH also can. NaOH is common one. In yellow noodle, yellow noodle, mi kuning, we use, well, if you ask those yang buat yellow noodle tu, dia kata dia tambah air abu. Air kapo. Air kapo tu apa? Air kapo is alkaline. Ya? Ya, kadang-kadang ada setengah orang panggil air abu. Ada setengah orang panggil air kapo. Ya? Kapo is calcium hydroxide. Uh, dulu orang tua yang orang Melayu kan yang tua-tua makan sirih kan dia taruh kapur uh, kapur tu is slime calcium hydroxide pun alkaline juga but the one that we use to make noodles yellow noodles Chinese call kansui kan uh, those are alkaline kansui betul saya sebut yeah? those are alkaline solution So when in, in noodle making, in making noodle, they add this kansoi or alkaline uh, to serve a few uh, purpose. One is actually to get the yellow, the, the natural yellow color. Yeah, the reaction with the pigment in the wheat flour will cause, uh, will will give the yellow color. But sometimes uh, some noodle manufacturer they even they add more yellow because. The natural yellow color may be not so strong, so they add yellow coloring. Uh, but anyway, we add uh, when we add alkaline uh, solution to starch, um, the starch would jelly nice. The starch would swell, even without heating. And in fact, if we use very high, highly concentrated, pekat uh, solution, uh, alkaline solution, the starch would even uh, degrade. Depolymerize, yeah. Depolymerize. Very easy to break. So very strong. Yeah. Yeah. If we use acid, it won't gelatinize the starch, but it will just break down the starch. It will fragment. So, if we use acid, very strong acid. Uh, to some extent, yes, uh, the starch would granule, but it will break down before it even start to swell very strong so this is actually used in the process of making dextrin later we will learn more about uh, dextrinization a process called dextrinization dextrinization is to produce dextrin and in this case we use highly concentrated acid yeah but later when we learn about modified starch we'll learn more about this yeah okay um, so This is another definition for gelatinization. Is the destruction of molecular order because in the granule we have a molecular order. The amylopectin form a, a, a semi-crystalline structure. So we destroy that crystalline structure. So when the starch gelatinized completely, it will become totally. What is the opposite of crystalline? Amorphous. It will become totally. Amorphous, so that's the, that, that's the meaning of of destruction of molecular order. So it become disordered. It become amorphous. Amorphous is disordered and irreversible swelling. In native granule, if at room temperature, the the, the granule will swell a bit about 20%, 25-28%. But if we remove the water, we dry, the granule will shrink back. So it's reversible. But during gelatinization, if you increase the temperature and the granule swell, at some point, if you stop remove the water you dry the swelling would not be reversible so after it exit certain point it become irreversible meaning that the starch has under, undergone partial gelatinization at least yeah. so irreversible swelling of starch granule under the influence of heat or 
and or chemicals in aqueous medium to give a starch paste. Uh, when the starch gelatin, we start from starch slurry or starch suspension. So in the in this form, if we don't heat, we just let it stand on the on the table, for example. The starch would precipitate, separate into clear water and starch layer. But once we cook the starch completely, gelatinize the starch completely, it won't separate anymore. It will form either one of or two forms of two forms. It will form paste or it will form gel. It will form paste or it will form gel. Which one? Which one? It will form paste or it will form gel? Which one? It depends on the concentration of starch. If we start maybe about 10% starch, then after the starch cook, we get paste. How do you know we get paste? It can pour. It can flow. If we start with 30% starch, but it depends on the type of starch also, uh, but most starch. A rice starch may be higher concentration. Uh, sago, potato, if 30% starch we cook, it will form gel. How do you know? Try to pour, it won't flow. Uh, so it depends on the concentration of starch. So this term, gel and paste, uh, be, be, uh, oh, so fast, huh? Oh, okay, that's a warning, we have to stop lah. Uh, so the term paste and gel, we have to differentiate. Uh, don't use it is uh, uh, is arbitrarily because it refers to whether the starch can flow or the starch form gel cannot flow. Okay, so we stop here.